Um, okay, so welcome everybody. And uh, I'm a final year PhD student uh, between uh, uh, the two schools, uh, civil engineering and computer science. Um, and so I'm going to graduate in a couple of months and I've had a collaboration with Deltares that I was usually uh, working before my PhD with a Dutch research institute specialized on uh, water as some subsurface. So my uh, supervisor is a combined team um, of uh, uh, people from the two different uh, uh, school of uh, and, uh, and Deltares. Uh, at the same time, I've also spent four months uh, at the beginning of um, uh, last year, visiting Professor Kanyada Kisa Brown University, uh, working on uh, on DeepOnet, as you're going to see uh, uh, later in my presentation. And also here, I must acknowledge the support that I got from LIFT. Um, so what's my PSD about? I've been using, or uh, try to use deep learning for groundwater forecasting. Uh, why, uh, why do we need groundwater forecasting? Why is deep learning, might, be, might deep learning be a good idea for that? Uh, so we want to forecast groundwater for different reasons. Uh, we might think of um, too little water, droughts. We must think of uh, too much water and the, the soil cannot penetrate and uh, floods can, uh, can be a direct consequence of that. Um, if, uh, if it's going to rain too much, the soil is saturated, it just does, doesn't have anywhere else to go uh, than to flood. And uh, as mentioned before, for uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the weather, uh, weather numerical models, the uh, same applies to other type of uh, numerical models. And for example, for the hydrogeological models, uh, so this model can be very computationally expensive, especially if we want to simulate uh, with high resolution uh, and in a, a large uh, spatial or uh, time, time scale. So having a model which can uh, uh, have very quick uh, estimate, uh, be accurate or accurate enough estimate, uh, would be quite uh, uh, would be quite uh, uh, quite nice, quite nice to quite nice to have. And here I also have uh, mentioned a few um, um, a few reasons why we would want to have uh, why the uh, models are computationally demanding and why would we want to have this uh, chip to run um, alternative. Um, so in my PST journey, I've been uh, going through different phases. Uh, so uh, first of all, I've been uh, uh, so what what I uh, what I've been doing is I uh, use the Matflow uh, model, which is the state of the art um, groundwater model. I create uh, the data set, like a small data set, and um, uh, and then on top, besides after that, then I can train with this data set a uh, uh, deep learning model. So that's kind of what I started with. Uh, so I um, I started from there, and then I kind of realized that the uh, these models were working. Uh, uh, so with this computer vision uh, standard techniques, these models were working quite well with this uh, fully observable, even if quite simple uh, data set. And then uh, and then I kind of realized that actually the world is uh, uh, if we want to move uh, to fully data driven models, uh, we might. Uh, we might want to uh, get closer to actually realities where we have like sparse uh, sparse data, so we don't have the knowledge everywhere, especially in a uh, um, subsurface where we have really much uh, sparse observation um, of, of the system. Uh, so in that case, my later question was, are um, these data, are they enough to uh, train a model only on top of that? Uh, so, especially in a, in a country, in a, a country like the Netherlands, um, where, where we have a lot of observation, could this observation be enough to train a model uh, uh, on that? Uh, and so that's what I went to uh, then my step number three, uh, this uh, temporal spatial graph neural networks. Um, and in between, a uh, large part of my, of my research was on uh, this neural operator, uh, which uh, learn try to learn the pdes um and uh, and by by learning the pdes then can be trained and evaluated on sparse data uh do i've been using the synthetic data for uh for that so the data that i that i generated um 
so as I mentioned before, I've, uh, the first step is to generate a data set. And of course, that's all a cyclic process. So I generate a simple data set, then I train the model, I evaluate the model, and then I try to make it harder and harder and, and so and so on, try to see um, when, it, when it breaks and how far can we can we go. So for example, here you can see a, a simple case in which the inputs are the uh, two, uh, uh, two on the on the top. Uh, so they, for example, a uh, material, uh, permeability, so the soil permeability. Uh, so we're looking, uh, uh, we're looking from uh, from above. Uh, so there might be, for example, say and clay, uh, sand and clay, and then we might have one location or multiple location in which I am extracting. Uh, so drinking water company are extracting water for uh, drinking purposes. Um, and then we want we want to see we want to simulate what the effect of abstraction is uh, for the aquifer. And then you have a distribution of uh, uh, groundwater level in time. Um, what you, uh, what I presented here is uh, 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 different uh, different cases. Uh, so, for example, in the first, in the uh, top one, um, what you can see is the is an input. Uh, so, this uh, random field, uh, which is the uh, permeability. Uh, then on top, I have a, a pumping wall. And then you can see the ground truth, the prediction, and the uh, uh, cross-section along that uh, pumping station. And then uh, uh, the same way, you could also train the model to do the inverse problem directly. So for example, here you see the input is the, uh, uh, the actual um, groundwater level. Uh, then you want to predict the uh, permeability of, of the soil, so that's ground truth. Um, the prediction is uh, is a smoother version, also because it's uh, is, uh, is uh, a non um, a non unique. The solution is also non unique. Uh, and then if you feed that to a forward simulation formulator, uh, being that the deep net, the trained deep net, or the um, uh, or the uh, uh, numerical solver, the final difference solver, then you get a corresponding hydraulic head that is uh, very much uh, the same as the uh, as the initial one. Um, uh, whereas here I've, uh, I present similar results, but uh, with a different approach, which is a unit and a vision transformer. So these are like classical computer vision techniques, and uh, what you see here is, uh, uh, is a very similar, a very similar approach. What you what you're not seeing here in uh, so you what you can see in the in the top top row is the ground truth and the prediction. You're not seeing the input. So the input is a random field for mobility, uh, random uh, field for the, uh, uh, for the hydraulic uh, conductivity. And then you have different pumping location of, uh, with different permeability, uh, with different pumping rate. And what you see in the bottom is the inverse problem, which I'm trying to predict the location of, uh, of these uh, uh, of this pumping and the pumping rate. So this might be, for example, a, a nice application for this is uh, imagine you have uh, uh, some irregular, uh, illegal uh, pumping, then you might be able to, to spot that. Um, and then finally, as I mentioned before, I was quite intrigued to the applicability to real world data. So as for now, I've, um, I was creating my synthetic data and training on top of that, uh, but of course you are like simpler, uh, uh, simpler toy, uh, uh, toy uh, data. And then I, I was curious to see how does it, uh, how different are real world data, and eventually if I, uh, if it would be possible to train, uh, to train a model only, only from that. Um, so then I've been collaborating with Vitens, which is the ma major drinking company in the Netherlands. And so, and I like we decided to take this uh, uh, study area, um, which is quite pretty uh, well confined by these two two rivers. So what you can see are all, all these blue dots, and here are uh, uh, sensor that measure the water level in different depths, so in different aquifers. So below you can see this uh, um, profile uh, in in depth with different aquifer. Um, and the uh, and there are four locations in which uh, uh, for uh, pumping uh, pumping station, um, so drinking water extraction station, and they extract from the second aquifer, the Dequan aquifer. So obviously the uh, the response of that abstraction is immediate in locations that are near it, uh, but it can be uh, very much delayed 
to uh, in a sensor that are located uh, in the uh, surface uh, near the surface um, and might be very different for example if they are located near a river uh, uh, because then they get the influence from the river. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, it's uh, it's quite a diverse and complex uh, system. Um, and so uh, what you can see here is uh, 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 you can see on the left, you can see three uh, time series. So we have data starting from the 50s. Um, and um, uh, the groundwater system is low, so even though we might have uh, daily data, we don't have much variability. Uh, so it's not that all it's not that all data are really useful, um, because many may, uh, many might be redundant. Uh, but what you can see here, for example, one of the problems that you get when you start using real world data is that you might have a lot of gaps, um, and uh, so the, the data are not are not. Uh, not idea as when you generate them. Um, but then the approach I've been using was a, a graph neural network um, because uh, because one and the uh, so a spatial temporal graph because I want to predict the water level in the future, but it's uh, uh, it's conditioned uh, by uh, all the sensors that are near it. Uh, so spatial temporal graphs are used quite a lot in uh, traffic forecasting. And it's kind of like the concept is a bit similar in the sense that uh, if there is uh, if there is a lot of uh, if there is a traffic jam uh, some few streets ahead, we might get um, uh, some consequences in our street. And similarly, if there is uh, water that is um, uh, the groundwater level is increasing somewhere nearby, it will have an impact also on the on the local sensor. Um, and so what what you can see in the bottom is uh, uh, is when I when I start. Uh, and obviously, what's um, uh, there are some exogenous variables such as rainfall and evaporation, and these are control variable. Uh, so what I try to predict is, given this control variable, how far can I predict the uh, groundwater groundwater level? And here, I'm, um, by using this control variable, then I can predict up to uh, even 100 weeks ahead, uh, which. Um, if we wouldn't know the precipitation evaporation with so much accuracy, uh, so uh, so much in advance, that we could have uh, quite uh, uh, quite accurate prediction of the groundwater level too. Um, so I think uh, some conclusion is uh, uh, well. First of all, for hydrological modeling, for groundwater modeling, we don't have uh, 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 good data sets. So I've been just creating my own data set. But I think that's very different compared to weather, where there are uh, like a weather bench or there are like some uh, good uh, data sets uh, that are uh, uh, that can be and can be easily trained on top of that. So I think I think after uh, demonstrating with this uh, toy model uh, that's uh, that AI can do a good work, I think the the next step would be to really create a data set with complex. Um, uh, complex your world uh, uh, scenario. Um, and then uh, going to the real world data, I think I think that's uh, I think that would be interesting to scale it up. So I only have only been studying a very small uh, region and I think it would be interesting to uh, scale it, scale it up. Uh, but of course there are a lot of uh, challenges and I think uh, when one uh, obvious one is the missing data, the fact that the missing data are all, Kind of in different time, so it's not possible really to align them. Um, uh, but also the fact that the temporal and spatial scales have, uh, can, can also be uh, very different. Uh, so uh, um, abstraction can have an immediate, um, uh, immediate effect in a sensor near it, but it can uh, that effect of that abstraction can be delayed by month uh, in a point um, uh, which is far away. Um, so finally, before concluding, I wanted to introduce, if you're not familiar with that, we have a CML community. Um, so uh, if, you, if you want to more, know more about, about that, we have uh, uh, five committee members and me, Miranda and Coker are here, and plus uh, Phil Livermore is uh, very much supporting us. Uh, so we are a group of uh, researchers, mainly PhD students working on machine learning, applying on uh, physical sciences, and we organize uh, 
quite a lot of uh, uh, things. Uh, we try to, to make it practical for a PhD student to really get uh, started and, uh, uh, and be able to exchange ideas in an informal setting. Uh, so we have monthly meetups, seminars, uh, workshops. We had an hackathon last year. And, uh, and at the end of, uh, uh, on the 18th of March, we're going to have a, um, also a workshop, which uh, is going to be held at, uh, at Imperia. So it's a collaboration between us, uh, Alan Turing and uh, uh, Imperia. And that's going to be about uh, physics and for machine learning. So uh, the uh, website is just live uh, since yesterday afternoon. Uh, but yes, keep, uh, keep tuned, keep informed.